welcome to our latest Hoops and Dreams QPR podcast, which is also episode 12. As in the past, uh, we'll be going over the last few games and then making our predictions for those coming up uh, before going into what hopefully are some juicy topics. Here to offer their thoughts and opinions and prevent this from becoming a monologue is Matt. A very warm welcome to you, Matt. Thank you for having me again. Hey, no, no, always happy to have you. Um, let, let's let's move straight on to uh, to looking at the the last three games, and I'll summarise these as quickly as I can and as painlessly as I can. Uh, QPR against Sheffield Wednesday, we lost that one two nil. Uh, Plymouth against QPR midweek, uh, we drew that one one one, and then we have Hull against QPR last Saturday, which we lost um, three nil. Okay, and um, those last three. League results translate into one point out of a possible nine. Uh, that leaves us 19th on 47 points. Um, so uh, we can obviously all recognise that this is uh, not the happy place to be. Matt, can I ask you for your quick summary of our fortunes in those last three games? Uh, yeah, I think we've sort of bring we sort of brought down back to earth. Really uh, easy for me to say. Um, it was a great Easter weekend. Uh, there's two wins. Everyone thought that's us safe. We only need probably one more win just to um, just to be sure. But the last three games, uh, yeah, just just I don't know what it is. I think maybe just some of the players just not not being as they were. Um, some players like Anderson and Chair will look really not really at it in in some of their performances and and uh yeah just a lack of great chances but just a lack of finishing and uh I saw a stat recently I think there's only one goal in between our three strikers in the last six months or so and that just does to show where we're at in terms of scoring goals in terms of our strikers. Um if we had a proper striker then who knows maybe higher in the table but I think where we are in the table right now, um, it just puts us in a situation where it's just one more loss can put us right back into uh, big, big trouble. And the fixtures coming up, uh, they're they're not really easy, and they're probably not the hardest running out of all the uh, of all the relegation candidates, really. Yeah, except maybe Blackburn, but um, uh, Blackburn have done remarkably well with their their ones. Uh, yeah, I mean after the highs of the last three games against Sunderland, Birmingham and Swansea, as you say. The, you know, the, the question is whether we could maintain that positive momentum. And as you say, everybody was looking happy and whatever. Uh, unfortunately, we got a resounding no in our performance against the Owls. Um, there was little enthusiasm for passing into the box, rather the glory shots. Um, so when against the odds, a clearance from Hayden deflected backwards into the net, you started feeling this was back to being the old QPR. Um, the second goal was a direct result of leaving ourselves exposed as we pushed forward for an equaliser. You know, no real harm in that. You can understand that. But really, it was a, a bad day at the office. And unfortunately, it was our office as well. Um, the Plymouth game uh, saw Marty making changes. Out went the excellent JCS uh, and the lesser Willock and Armstrong. In came Fox, Smith and Dyke. So you, you would have hoped for better things. This was not another Wednesday performance, but rather a dogged fighting one that we saw on Tuesday. They, we deserved to score first, and their equaliser was just one of those weird goals, I guess you've got to say, um, which left us with Hull away, who were 10th uh, at that time, 61 points, with a mixed record of results. Um, I felt a sense of dread when I heard the commentary team say Hull have not won in seven games at home. I said on the Hoops and Dreams forum during the game how satisfying it was to see a side adopting uh, Sia Fuentes' mantra of fast breaks and moving the ball over defensive lines. But annoyingly, it was Hull I was talking about. It was probably not helped by starting with Fox and Dunn, you know, rather than the more mobile pile and, uh, you know, or Cannon, uh, as they as they were literally being overrun. Uh, and of course, it it did not help that Birmingham, Blackburn, Plymouth and, and Millwall had no such problems winning. 
We are now only three points off the relegation sides with tougher games than most of those ahead of us. There is no doubt the light at the end of the tunnel seems so much further away at the moment. So let's skip quickly onto the predictions that you alluded to. Um, first one is on Saturday. It's QPR against Preston North End. Uh, we're very fortunate. That's the lowest team that we're playing. Um, they are 10th on 63 points. Um, Matt, what do you reckon? Win, draw or loss? I've gone for a win. Uh, probably heart overhead. Um, just, I think, yeah, I think this is the game we've got a target to get three points. Um, yes, it's on Sky. We're not good on Sky. Um, we're playing We're playing after all the teams around us are playing first. So who knows how the mentality is going to be within our players. Um during the game and, and it's it's now at must win stage now, unfortunately. Um but you alluded to we we dropped points against Plymouth, Sheffield Wednesday, those were the two teams that we had to get three points from. Mm-hmm. Only one point came out of it and Preston is another one where they don't they don't score many goals. They got oh. Schweiker who who doesn't score consistently, similar to Dykes. He's got a hatch against Huddersfield, albeit Huddersfield are um, in in trouble as well. But they don't score many goals, and I think this is one we got a target out the out the uh, at the last three really to get a win. So I'm going for winning this one. Okay, I, I admire your optimism. Uh, next one is QPR against Leeds the following week. Um, they're on their third at the moment on 87 points, I think. Uh, win, draw, loss. I've gone for a loss on this one. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting how see how the uh, how the race is between mitigation and promotion by the time that comes around. Um, Leeds could be they can either win maybe to the top or go in the promotion places. So there will be a major major threat, and they've got some talent in their squad. And um, yeah, they'll be really really dangerous coming to Lotters Road, and it's on Friday as well. So um, that should be a very entertaining entertaining night and last home game of the season. Hopefully it doesn't come to that stage where we do need a win to take it to the last day, which we all don't want. So, uh, but I'm going for a loss just because their quality side leads on their day. Yeah. Okay. Um, last one, last of the season, Coventry against QPR. Uh, Coventry is sitting eighth on 63 points uh, with a, a mixed bag. They don't seem to draw very much at the moment. They're, they're just winning or losing. Mm-hmm. Um, so win, draw, loss. Uh, sorry to say this, I've gone for a loss as well. Um, yeah, it's 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 gonna be a difficult one up there. The only thing I can sort of put a positive twist on it is sort of they're in the FA Cup semi final against United. If they win that, then their mind might be switched off to to the cup final. Um, so who knows? The mentality might be different then. Uh, they're they're not in well they're in the playoff race but they're quite a few points off it so by then the season might be over so hopefully they'll let us let us win that one um, but it's it's really tough to go up there they got a they got a pretty pretty decent home record um, this season and uh, yeah I think it'll be difficult for us up there yeah I've yeah, fair fair points I think really uh, I mean you rightly mentioned that uh, Preston North End uh, uh, beat Huddersfield. 4-1. I mean, I think, I think 4 one's the score. So, um, so that, that was a really resounding victory for them. Um, and we always knew that these last three games against promotion-seeking sides would be tough. Uh, the plan must have been to have secured our survival before then. Uh, but that's not happened. Um, so we're in the unenviable position of hoping we can gain points somewhere along the line in these last three games and hoping that others are going to slip up. Uh, logic says that we lose all three. Um, but I would be delighted with draws against uh, Coventry and Preston. Um, and that's what I've gone for. So I, Leeds, is, I think, is a game too far. We're, I can't see that. Although it, it must be, we must bear in mind, you know, you alluded to the fact that Coventry need to think about their um, uh, their future fixtures. Um, and exactly the same in a way might apply to, uh, to Leeds. If they are in the playoff uh, side, they may well bring in a lower side, a lower uh, strength team uh, to play us. 
you know, if by then they are guaranteed playoff place and not an automatic promotion. We will see. That's a good point. That's a good point. It's either way, it, it's not in our own destiny, is it, at the moment? No, no, it's uh, we should be, but it's not. And that's a frustrating, frustrating thing as a QPR fan most of the time. We never make it easy. It, sh it should have been a couple of games ago, but it's not. So, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yep, it is what it is. Um, a few episodes, <laughs> episodes ago, Joe Perry and I discussed the relegation battle. Uh, and even though it does not involve QPR, I thought it'd be a good idea to review the candidates aiming for the Premier League. And so if we take 63 points as being the cutoff point on, you know, on the 13th of April, um, that rules out uh, Watford, Swansea, Sunderland, Bristol City and Cardiff. I think, I think that goes up as far as 11th. Um, and that leaves, as it stands on the uh, at that point, uh, Ipswich are first, um, followed by Leicester, um, there's only one point between them, and there's equally only one point between them and Leeds um, on 87. And then we've got Southampton a good bit behind uh, on 81. And then West Brom, Norwich, they're all on 70. Um, and then they're 70 ish. Uh, and then you've got Hull, Coventry, uh, Middlesbrough, and uh, dare I say it, Preston, all on, in the 60s. Uh, they, that that's sort of where the area you're looking at for finishing in the playoffs, I think. Uh, no further down than that. Uh, so, Matt, is it inevitable that Leicester, with its largely Premier League players, will top the table? Or, or can Ipswich or even Leeds steal it from them? Uh, I think Leicester will finish a job in the end. I know they've, they've lagged a few couple of games. Uh, Plymouth recently. Um, which was a poor performance. But uh, yeah, they, I think right now they can't afford any more slip-ups, but they've got loads of quality in their squad. They've got depth uh, in terms of substitutions. Um, so I think they'll get over the line. Uh, Leeds and Plymouth are pushing them really hard. Um, not Plymouth, sorry, Ipswich. Um, they're really pushing them hard. And massive credit to Ipswich, what they've done from last season to this season. Uh, great mechanics done a great job. Um, wouldn't be surprised if he gets manager of the season. Um, I just think with Leeds and, and Ipswich, they're very open with their open, expansive football. They store lots of goals, but they can see lots of goals. And I just think Leicester are a bit more, a bit better defensively, and I think they'll get the job done. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, yeah, I think you might well end up being right there. Um, so if we're looking at those those three sides, which we really are for, for being amongst the automatic promotion ones, realistically, um, which of those sides do you think would stand the best chance of survival in the Premier League and why? You would say Leicester sort of straight away because of the, the pedigree they have and, and just because of the size of the club they've, they have built in the last sort of 10 years or so. You know, they won the Premier League, they won the FA Cup, Greenwich Shield. I think relegation was so unexpected of them uh, from last season. So obviously the expectation was to get back up straight away. Um, my only worry for them is uh, they have financial problems. I know they've they they've not at the risk of getting points deduction, but there's always a chance next season it could happen. So if they get a points deduction, then they're at risk straight away. Um, but they've got they they have a good bunch of players there like Harry Winks and. Vardy still going, you know, they still got some uh, players that have played in the Premier League. So um, I think they'll have enough um, in terms of Leicester. Uh, Leeds, Daniel Fark is an experienced manager, being at the best record in the Premier League, especially with Norwich in, in recent times. Mm -hmm. And with Ipswich, it will be decades it's a, in the Premier League. So um, they will be like enjoying the Premier League, but it's whether, they, whether they, their football will survive. Burnley struggled this season with their with their style of football. So if you have a philosophy that works in the championship, will always work in the Premier League. So maybe at some point they'll need to switch up their style of play. So it's which may struggle the most out of the three. Yeah. I, I look looking at the three sides that we've identified in the mix, um I, I would say that Leeds actually at the moment is showing the best current form. Uh along with Ipswich of course, who, who've had a phenomenal season. You know, they They've just done fantastic. Um, 
but the sides that look best prepared for the Premier League would not necessarily include Ipswich. Uh, and you were right to bring up Burnley, because I, th I think as an example, um, Burnley's taken almost this whole season to adapt to the Premier League. Um, I think the side best able to be to adapt will end up being Leeds, uh, Southampton or Leicester if we if we were looking further down. You know, Southampton would obviously do very well. No great surprise there because all of them are filled with uh, Premier League level players. So yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. I, I really do wish the the very best for for Ipswich on this though. I I think it's a great story they've had. Uh, they've done really well this year, and full credit to them. I just just wish it had been us. It's the wrong. No, absolutely. Wrong team in blue. Yeah. Yeah, the one blue and white. <laughs> so, so, having indicated which side you feel will stand the best chance of survival in the Premier League, which side do you think is best suited to win in the playoffs and, and why? You would expect Southampton, like you mentioned, uh, because of the squad they have. They're, they're bagged with strikers, Armstrong, Shea Adams. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're, def they're, full of, they're full of talent. Um, and they score loads of goals, but they do concede quite a few. Um, West Brom are there as well. Yeah. Um, but I'll say the likes of West Brom and, and Norwich as well, who are in the pack, they, they've been inconsistent at times this season, but they've got wins to basically just state their place and they and they have they have quality, they have quality in forward areas as well. So, but Southampton, I think, um, they've 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 been consistent the most out of the playoff teams. Um, Southampton went on a twenty-five unbeaten run, I think it was something like that, and and uh, yeah, they they played some really good stuff this season, and uh, yeah, I'll say Southampton is the best bet for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, as we said, there was three, there's three at the top that contend in for two spot automatic spots. Um, if if Leeds stays in their current position, uh, they would be playing the playoffs, and you've got to fancy them. I think or, you know, been really impressed by them. Um, Southampton, as you say, for the, for the reasons that you mentioned about the quality of the of the, of the team or the squad, rather. Um, but I was also impressed by Hull on some Sunday, Saturday. I've got to say because they actually were very, very good. You know, uh, yeah. it wasn't just that that um, they met a team that was just not performing because we weren't. Um, they they had good goals. So anyway. This is an opportunity for all of you at home to comment on this topic. You've obviously got your own ideas as to who you think uh, uh, should be going up, who should be doing better in the playoffs. Um, please add your comments either on the Hoops and Dreams forum uh, itself, or if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, then add something below. You know, it's always good to have some interesting feedback. Um, it's been really some really good stuff actually this year. Uh, really good. Okay, on to our second topic. If the end of the season was tomorrow, Matt, who would you vote for as Player of the Year and why? My vote will go to Sam Field. Um, yeah, I think he's been consistent throughout the season. Steady even under Ainsworth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, 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 you, never have, you never really have a bad word to say about him. Um, even in the big defeats that we had this season, uh, one off the top of my head was the Blackburn 4 0 loss. Um, you know, you, you never really mentioned him in terms of mistakes and howlers. Um, you know, he always puts in a shift in. He, uh, he, he, he tries to get the team forward. I see Sanfield and forward it, getting forward a lot more in recent months. So he always has an attitude of, of being positive and, and pushing the team on, where he's quite vocal as well, which I've seen. Quite recently, um, and yeah, even under Ainsworth and now under Marty, he's uh, he's thriving and uh, he's always that. He's a, he's a really good stopgap in that midfield and knows how to make the perfect tactical foul. Um, and yeah, I think he's been consistent this season. So my my vote would go Sanfield. Wow, oh, this is a really interesting topic, and I'm not just saying that because I made it up. Um, Usually, this accolade goes to a, a midfielder or attacker. Um, but I think the lack of goals rules out any striker or, um, or attacking midfielder other than Ilias Chair, to be quite honest. Uh, I equally do not, don't, don't think that Asmir Begovic um, has done enough, uh, really, to, to justify being included. And 
you know, you've included Sam Field and I, I eliminated him because I thought, although he's been a steady Eddie, and I do agree with you on that, and he has been there all season, I just felt he hadn't sparkled as much as last season. Um, perhaps I'm being grossly overfair to him, and if so, Sam, I do apologise. Um, for me, the contenders would be Ilias Chair, as I mentioned, Steve Cook, uh, Jake Clark Salter, uh, Kenneth Powell, uh, and, and even Jimmy Dunn. Um, which says a lot about our game this season, that I'm talking mostly about defenders. Um, <laughs> while Steve Cook has been a late arrival, uh, and you're, you're probably right to mention at that point that, uh, that I mentioned some who haven't been here all season, um, Cook has been a wise head uh, who's used his experience to defend at, at a high level. Um, Jake Clark Salter would have been my choice if he'd been fit all season, uh, if he was playing like this all season. Uh, because like Cook, he's been calmly confident and effective. Uh, I could have gone for someone who who fought to be selected as centre-back before taking on the right-back position, and good God, he really did well. He, not, he kept out two qualified right-backs. Jimmy Dunn has been fantastic in his defending. He's also added much-needed height and heading prowess in midfield, uh, and his movement down the wing has been superb. Plus, I believe he can score. Um, that le that leaves us with <laughs> Kenneth Powell and Ilias Chair. Powell has been in the left back position pretty much all season, and he's consistently battled to get the ball and move up the wing. Ilias Chair has worked his socks off from a left winger position, um, but his square peg and a round hole fit has been the only positive when it comes to attacks for most of the season. It is also no real secret that he's been frustrated by the lack of attacking options when on the ball. So I'm torn between Kenny and Illy, but for me, Ilias has just edged it. Um, so this is yet another one, folks. If, if you've got your thoughts on this, please add them in in the comments because you know we're not saying we're right, just that we think we're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, on to our next one. Uh, I'm assuming that Asmir Begovic will not be at Loftus Road next year. Um, so Matt, who would you want as your next captain? Like you mentioned, uh, I would have Steve Cook as our captain. Um, I had to double check if it was a one year deal or two year deal that we signed him on because if I said Steve Cook as our captain, then he won't be here next season. There's no point in saying that. Um, but it's a two year deal, he'll be here next season. And uh, I just love his attitude. Uh, I've loved his attitude in the last couple of weeks. Um, he, he's, 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 he's such a leader, such an experienced leader level-headed most of the time. Um, I've seen him do last-ditch challenges when it comes to in the penalty box. Yeah, um, yeah and, he, and he... Yeah, I just, I just love his attitude. He, he reminds me of a... He reminds me of Clint Hill in some ways. Um, he's very vocal. Yeah. Um, he's always passing that message to, you know, that we're together, we're, we're, we're fighting for this, you know. you They're not letting any player in the squad put their head down or anything like that. You know, he's... He's kept the mentality on a good level to have these positive last couple of months. I know the last couple of results haven't been the best, um, but since February, um, he's, he's come in, struck up a great partnership with uh, Jake Clark Salter, and uh, yeah, they've, they've been rocks at the back, and and uh, he, he's been fantastic. So Steve Cook for me. Um, Sandfield, we've probably my, my sort of vice captain if, he, if he's not playing in Sandfield maybe because of longevity how he's been at the club um, he's, he's, he's been really good and he's, he's a fan favourite as well Sandfield as well so um, if he does get a player of the season um, then I think it, from his attitude and just in, in endeavour and he's, he's quite he's now more vocal now he's not as quiet as he used to be when he first joined um, he would be my sort of vice captain choice Okay, that, that all of that makes sense, uh, especially when you hear what I've got to say. Um, for me, <laughs> the goalkeeper as the captain this season really hasn't worked, uh, especially as Begovic is not really that vocal. Um, I, I feel you need no. someone able to encourage and harangue players, as you've indicated, everywhere on the pitch. Uh, and this cannot be achieved by a goalie. Uh, the same really applies if you have uh, a striker as a captain. For the same reasons, it's getting 
you know, that, that message across all the pitch. You know, if you're up too far up front or too far at the back, it's not that easy to do. So unless you use the captaincy purely as an added incentive to sign Charlie Austin or Asmir Begovic, I feel the role should go to someone more central in the park, and I also feel it should be somebody who's influential. Um, so like you, that means two candidates for me, Samfield and Steve Cook. Both have done the job elsewhere and both have the personality to motivate others. Of the two, probably because of the expected greater number of appearances, uh, you know, next season, I, I would go for Sam Field. So I'm not that far away from you on this one. Uh, no. But, you know, maybe, maybe those watching this have got their own ideas on this. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's what I feel and that's what Matt feels. So uh, if you feel differently, let us know. Uh, okay, that brings us to the end of episode 12. It does seem to have gone past very quickly. Um, it has, it has, for sure. But can I thank <laughs> Matt, obviously, thank you very much for coming on with your usual enthusiasm. No uh, problem at all. Good, and editor Dave, who continue, continues to make these podcasts uh, so much better than they really are, and, and all of you for watching. If you're on the YouTube channel, we'd like you to, to press subscribe, and we'd also like to hear a comment or two from you. If you're watching it on the Hoops and Dreams forum again, add your comments as usual down below. This is my last podcast of the season, and it's also the last podcast in this format. Changes are underway for next season, but for now, I'm Brian Fisher, and this has been a Hoops and Dreams QPR podcast. And all I want to say is, come on, you ours. Come on, you ours. We know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR.